the job of like putting them all up yeah, straight. Apps. One, two. Hi, everyone. I'll just uh, ask you to take your seat, enjoy your morning coffee, and we are going to start. Um, I know it's your first day, but I will still remind some practical uh, information. Uh, if you require textual interpretation, uh, you know that you can use the speech-to-text tool that is available for each of the focus panels and plenaries, and it's available in 23 languages. And whether you're in the room or you're following the conference uh, online, you can participate in the Q&A by going to the Slido link. I'm sure you're all very familiar now with uh, Slido. And I'm going to uh, start this plenary for the last session of the Beyond Growth Conference. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here. So I'm Manon Aubry. I'm the co-chair of the left group here in the European Parliament. Um, I used to work for the NGO Oxfam, as a disclaimer, before being electing, elected here in the European Parliament. Um, so I still consider myself as an activist, and I should say how happy I am to see so many activists actually in the room. And I wish you would come here a little bit more often, and I think I will think a little bit less on my own. Um, it's the third and last day of the conference, and given the quality of all of the previous sessions, I doubt that I need to emphasize, emphasize why it is necessary to switch from a growth-driven um, economic framework, uh, sorry, from a growth-driven uh, economic framework to one beyond growth. But it's not the least of the tasks that is waiting for us today. Find out how to build a post-growth macroeconomic governance framework. So I know that from the title you might think, wow, okay, what are we going to dive in today? But you'll see that it's very key for our post-growth economy. It's dealing, dealing with concrete issues that we're discussing here in the European Parliament that will be key in the next few months with the debate around the reform of the Stability and Growth Pact. The name says it all, but I will get back to it. I'll start with what I heard two days ago. I have to say, I was pleased to hear President van der Leyen saying on Monday that the growth model is obsolete. Usually, when I say that in this hemicycle, well, I don't have that much echo, I should say, and usually it doesn't please so much of my colleagues sitting on that side of the hemicycle. So I can say that um, you should come here more often 
because your presence here probably already had a lot of impact, maybe even more than sometimes we can have as member of European Parliament. So I wanted to thank you all because it's already a big move, at least in the words. But as the saying goes, there is no love. There are only proofs of love. And so far, the proofs on the EU side are all directed to economic growth. That remains the prism through which the EU designs and assesses every single policy. Because up to now, EU's institutions and policies have been all about growth. It's currently everywhere in the European treaties and European policies. It's in the European fiscal rules, in the mandate of the European Central Bank, the European Green Deal, the recovery plan. The European Commission even has an entire and powerful Directorate General for Growth. They don't have a Directorate General for the well-being, for example. That can be a suggestion that we can pass along to Ursula von der Leyen. Growth is everywhere because we've been told it's everything. The curve to take, the path to follow, the goal to achieve. It's the silver bullet in pretty much every single legislation that goes through this institution and in every corner of national policy making. But this silver bullet might eventually kill us. The last decades have shown us that none of the things that really matter since enough to sacrifice when it comes to fostering economic growth. Public services, public infrastructures and investments, social security, solidarity, workers' rights and fair wages, common goods, environmental protection, all of this have been considered as a mere viable to achieve economic growth. At the same time, tax competition has been encouraged as the European level and public revenues fell in an endless race to the bottom, leading to even more austerity. Let me emphasize the absolute absurdity of this reasoning. We're told that growth will bring us prosperity and well-being in the future, but for that, they dismantle the very things that bring us prosperity and well-being in the present. And since growth never comes back, or never enough to their eyes, we are told we should keep digging forever for it and undermining what keeps us together as a society. This is a vicious circle that we need to get out. That being said, the crisis that we have faced forced EU institutions to put on hold some of the key dogmas. The crisis being the pandemic, being the energy crisis, being the climate crisis, half questions neoliberal dogma. Even in this house, things are changing. I've seen Philip that just arrived, and I think this opportunity to thank Philip has been, you know, I'm, I'm a new member of the European Parliament since this mandate, and there are people who've shown the way some time ago. So thanks, Philip, for showing the way, because it's also with the collaboration of all left groups that we reach that point. But now, things have been shaken up. It's obvious that mitigating the impact of lockdowns would have been impossible without public intervention and social security nets. Still, fighting COVID would have been much easier if public hospital had been properly found. Keeping energy prices low and limiting inflation would have been much easier with energy considered as a common good that does not have to abide by the laws of competition. And similarly, coping with the present and coming consequences of climate catastrophe will be easier if we have fiscal and policy space to carry out massive investments in mitigation and adaptation rather than waiting for the private sector to decide whether it's in, in their interest or not. Over the last few months, as a result of this context, even the European Commission has questioned its own dogmas that are at the root of the European Union policies, 
which are, I have to say, real cultural victories for us. We've been challenging these rules for quite some time now. The energy market is being revised. The state aid rules have been adopted. And what interests us for today's session, the Growth and Stability Pact has been suspended for now three years, and everyone now agrees that it was for the best. This pact, the Growth and Stability Pact, is the cornerstone of the EU economic governance and coordination, framing the budgetary rules, how much countries can spend, where they should spend into, and what happens if they spend too much. Beyond that acronym that is not so much popular, it's actually key to understand nowadays economic policies. It's also one of the main tools to promote growth-related policies. The name says it's all, Growth and Stability Pact. I wish of the day we'll have the well-being and ecological pact, the fight inequalities and ecological pact. But this is not what we have today. It's very clear from the name, and member states' proposed reforms are therefore assessed by the European Commission as part of the European semester, precisely to stimulate growth, and the European Commission makes recommendations in that direction. The objectives that are set in the Growth and Stability Pact, I'm sure you're all familiar with them, 3% deficit rule, 60% debt rule, equally never make sense. I've hardly found an economist, even among neoliberal economists, I've hardly found any defending the, 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 why they choose that specific number. Why is it 3% deficit? Why not 2%? Why not 4% deficit? And we all know that there's no specific justification, in particular in the post-growth world. And on top, those rules are nowadays totally unrealistic. The average deficit in the Eurozone is 4.7%, and the average debt is 91.6% of GDP, very far from the 3% and 60%. And guess what? None of the EU states have collapsed. Yes, it's possible to go beyond the 3% deficit rule and the 60% deficit rule, debt rule. The EU is now at a crossroads. Asking member states to respect the targets, we all know it, would mean firing millions of public servants or killing social security system. Is it really what they want? Do they really want to reintroduce those rules with the consequences that we know? As usual, the, the debate will be go back to business as usual or shift to a post-growth economic model. And as usual again, the European Commission say, this time we have understood, you know, with the sense of gravity that Ursula von der Leyen can rightly have. Yes, this time we've have, we have understood. Everything is going to change, we'll fix it. Well, look at the reform of the, economics of the economic governance framework that the European Commission has proposed a couple of weeks ago. For me, this is really not up to what is at stake. Yes, they will introduce more flexibility, so the states will have a bit more time to obey by those rules. But keeping the same outdated targets of 3% deficit rule and 60% debt, and even more, introducing more sanctions for member states that are deviating from those rules and keeping the objective of growth. But yes, covering it with objective like inclusive and sustainable because growth can be inclusive and sustainable. You've all heard yesterday Vice President Dombrovskis of the European Commission saying again and speaking about, again about fair and sustainable growth. This reminds me of a quote from an American economist, Kenneth uh, Boulding, who said, anyone who believes that exponential growth can go on forever in an infinite world is either a man-man 
or an economist. Maybe we can add that it can be a European commissioner. Which brings us to the key question of today's session with our panelists. Can there really be a so-called sustainable and inclusive growth? Do we want to go back to business as usual or to shift to a post-growth economic model? And if yes, how can the macroeconomic framework can be a tool for this? What are the alternative indicators that we should use to shift to a post-growth economic model. It's clear that we won't be able to face the two main challenges of our time, climate crisis and social inequalities, unless we do not set radically new orientations and new economic rules. This is the objective of our discussion today. Because in the end, I want to leave you with that question. What is the point? of having a balanced budget, of having a 60% uh, debt rule and 3% deficit rule on a dead planet. You probably all know that famous quote, when the last tree has been cut down, the last fish cut, the last river poison, only then we will realize that one cannot eat money. And maybe we should add now, here from the European Parliament, that only then, we realize that one cannot eat growth. Thank you very much. And let me introduce now um, the panel uh, and the plenary of today and our great speakers. Some of them will be uh, speaking remotely. Maybe let's uh, they participation to degrowth. They didn't take the plane to travel here. We don't want to blame them. Um, so we'll, we'll start with a video message from Yolanda Diaz, who is uh, the second vice president and minister of labor and social economy of Spain, representing the next presidency of the European Union, taking over 1st of July. Then we'll have Joseph Stiglitz speaking remotely, professor at the Columbia University Nobel Prize of Economics. Then we'll have Benoit Lallemand, uh, Secretary General of Finance Watch. Then we'll have online Philippa Sigkroner, who is the director of the think tank, sorry, I don't speak any German, so Desernat Sukunt, and I, I'm very sorry for the pronunciation. And finally, uh, Louison Caronfouro, who is uh, the assistant professor at the Roskilde University in Denmark and member of the International Society for Ecological Economics. Um, I'll start with the, giving the floor to uh, Yolanda Diaz. Well, it's not exactly giving the floor because she's uh, recording uh, the video, a video message that will be the only, one, uh, the only video message for today, but I think it was important to hear the next presidency of the Council. Thanks again. Manon, Joseph, participants, it is a pleasure to take part in this Beyond Growth conference. We need more spaces like this in which we can think about and discuss the present and future of the European project. To transform Europe, we need to transform its monetary policy and its institutional architecture. The European Central Bank has a mandate to maintain price stability and tools, mainly interest rates that are too limited to properly address the challenges of EU economic governance. This should come as no surprise. The institution was created in the 1990s, a decade in which the macroeconomic policy priorities were diametrically opposed to today's. If we want the ECB to be able to rise to current challenges, we will need a more ambitious reinvention. Monetary policy will have to expand its goals, incorporating into its mandate considerations such as social cohesion, climate sustainability, and indeed, why not, even full employment. At the same time, and as has been shown by the success of the Iberian exception, the ECB must realise that interest rates are neither the only nor the most appropriate tool with which to tackle an energy price shock. 
Therefore, an urgent reform of the European energy market and an acceleration of the energy transition are a better way to combat inflation rather than reckless interest rate hikes decided upon in Frankfurt. The EU can be, moreover, the main driver of democratic ecological planning on a global scale. Thanks to its robust legislation, its size, its defence of climate diplomacy and its capacity to prevent a race to the bottom between member states. In the current context, achieving the goals of the European Green Deal is becoming more urgent than ever. Indeed, an expanded deal in which our ambition has been stepped up and our goals brought forward must be our main political compass in the coming decade. Intensifying a just energy transition is also the best possible sanction against the Moscow regime. The Fit for 55 legislative agenda must be more ambitious in promoting renewable energy and decarbonisation in key sectors such as industry and housing. Public authorities have a duty to facilitate public and private investment so that it can accelerate a just climate transition. This does not mean giving companies carte blanche. They must respect a new set of social and environmental standards commensurate with these challenges. Moreover, it is necessary to strengthen instruments such as the Just Transition Fund and the Social Climate Fund, and to examine the possibility of creating a financial tool designed to mitigate the social and labour-related impacts of the major transformations to come. The European Green Deal is also an opportunity to engage in fiscal innovation through a climate emergency tax on large fortunes, for example, to carry out a green reform of national accounting systems, to commit to a green industrial planning that redresses territorial imbalances within the EU and to implement a model of energy democracy that is informed by the lessons learned from prior dependencies and that puts the interests of European citizens first. Our country has chosen to enter the debate on reform of Europe. We have chosen to move from words to action. Together with Belgium, Spain has proposed the creation of a social convergence mechanism, a system designed to identify imbalances in social rights with a feminist approach, a system that is able to define rapid and effective responses and that is able to do so with the same rigour and foresight as uh, that with which economic imbalances are detected. This mechanism, which is being developed by the technical committees, is a necessary first step to strengthen the role of the EBSC Council and thus reconfigure the European semester. Europe cannot continue to be uh, what the ECOFIN wants and decides. Social affairs are not a mere side issue, an afterthought. They offer a cross-cutting perspective from which to build an EU that protects its social majorities, that puts people first. The goal is to reconcile social justice and economic solvency in the belief that governance can only be effective if it is socially just and ecologically sustainable. To conclude, only a few years ago, a minimum wage directive in the European Union would have been unimaginable. Today, it is a fact. In Spain, moreover, we have shown that raising the minimum wage not only improves people's lives, but also has no negative impact on employment. We have learned that Europe must do everything it can to protect people, precisely because shocks such as the pandemic or the outbreak of war are difficult to predict. We must work to ensure that the new common sense that is starting to make itself heard can underpin a stable and permanent playing field for Europe. What Mariana Matsukata calls the Cornwall Consensus summarises what we must consolidate in Europe. Pivot from repairing, intervening only after the damage is done, to preparing, taking steps in advance to protect citizens and ensure a future in times of instability, war and climate crisis. I am convinced that we will achieve this. Thank you very much. Thanks to... uh
Yolanda for giving us the, the big picture um, from the council perspective and the upcoming challenges for, for Spain as they will um, chair the, the council in the coming months. Now I'm going to turn to uh, Joseph Stiglitz. Um, I assume everyone here in the rooms uh, knows uh, Joseph Stiglitz, who's going to join us uh, online. He's the professor of economics at the Columbia University. Um, you've been, uh, Joseph, uh, the chief economist of World Bank between 97 and 2000, and you won the Nobel Peace Prize of Economics in 2001. I was one of those students uh, sneaking into the room when I was a student in Columbia to, to, to come to, to listen to your lecture. So I'm very glad now to welcome you here in the European in Parliament, or at least uh, remotely. Um, you, we wanted, and it was very important for us to have you uh, today, uh, because of course you've been a very important role on, when it comes to the economic uh, governance framework, and uh, you, in particular, on the EU fiscal rules uh, in deeply uncertain times, I quote you, uh, which I think is, the context is one of the tools we can use to, to challenge uh, the current uh, rules. And I know you've also made proposals to reform them, so it would be great to, to hear you uh, uh, on that. So I pass you on the floor, Joseph, it's yours. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be able to talk to you about this important issue. I think the two previous speakers have really uh, set the agenda well. Um, I want to begin with uh, emphasizing uh, what you said, which is the priority shouldn't be economic growth, but uh, increasing well-being. Uh, the old view was that if we increased growth, everybody would benefit. Uh, Trickle-down economics. We know that's not true. Uh, we've seen uh, growth with increasing inequality, with all the benefits of the growth going to those at the very top, uh, those at the bottom actually getting worse off. But we also thought that increasing economic growth would lead to the increase in well-being in all of its other dimensions. And again, we know that's not true. What we've seen in the United States is that growth has continued, but life expectancies have actually decreased. And disparities in health between the, the, the well-off and the less well-off have increased. So. I think it is very important to shift the focus from material economic growth to a broader set of indicators of well-being. Uh, the Sarkozy Commission uh, and the work actually of the OECD have uh, uh, suggested a, a wide range of indicators of well-being that should be guiding whether we are being successful or not. As we think about what we need to do in the coming years, we will have to have growth, but I want to emphasize it's the quality of growth, the nature of the growth. We need to foster technical change, to break the link between uh, economic output and environmental degradation. I believe we can do that. I believe that we can have an increase in well-being without an increase in carbon emissions. But that will take uh, innovation, creativity. From a macroeconomic perspective, macroeconomic management uh, in the coming years will have to deal simultaneously with a number of standard problems as well as some new problems. It'll be the usual, which is maintaining the economy at full employment, even as we fight inflation and face AI and robotization. We'll have to st restore greater equality, and we'll have to invest in the future, especially for the green transition. I want to emphasize uh, seven points of uh, how we can achieve uh, this broader increase in well-being. Um, I want to begin with the moment where we are today. Today's inflation is mainly supply-driven, and as the pandemic and war-related interruptions are addressed, is likely to ease. The important point 
is that it was not caused by excess demand. And therefore, and this is the second point, raising interest rates in the way the ECB and the Fed have recently done may impede the necessary adjustment, adjustments, both in the short-term supply interruptions and the green, green transition, and unnecessarily contribute to unemployment and inequality. Once we recognize that this is not a usual inflation with excess demand, but is an unusual inflation, a result of the pandemic-related supply-side interruptions and shifts in the pattern of demand and the uh, increase in oil and food prices, energy prices. Uh, in I can hear, oh no. Uh, <laughs> we've lost you, Joseph, if, if you hear us still. Now I have to improvise so I can go into in-depth in into the growth and stability pact with all of the nerdy details. Um, we're going to try a, a new time to connect or should I go to the next speaker? What, what's the preference? Yeah, we try. Hopefully you can connect again, Joseph. We're going to wait for a couple of seconds. In the meantime, I can make a new promotion of the Slido uh, questions. By the way, if you ask questions on Slido, um, try to direct the, the, to the persons, like you can indicate the person you want to ask the question to. Okay. All right, it seems like it doesn't work. So we are going to go to the next speaker and hopefully we can uh, have Joseph back uh, with us in, or at least remotely. And I'm going to um, move on now to uh, Benoit. Um, Benoit Lallemand, here on my right, not politically speaking, or I don't know. <laughs> Benoit is the Secretary General of uh, Finance uh, Watch. Finance Watch is part of a broader coalition of CSOs, NGOs uh, that work on the EU economics uh, governance framework and that is looking more specifically at the fiscal rules and its reform. It was very important for me and for us to have the point of view of the civil society and NGOs because and that's precisely what Finance Watch tried to connect. They connect the technical work that is done in the Econ Committee, so the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs, in which I sit. Um, and they connect the technical work with the real life of people, with the concrete impact of people, because the budgetary rules are not just a theoretical exercise. They have concrete consequences on the life of people and on the planet. And this is why it was so important to have you, you today, uh, Benoit. And um, hopefully you can uh, talk us through uh, the expectations of the civil society on the reform. Thanks very much, Benoit, again. Thank you. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here with you. Um, I was walking through the park, come to, coming to the parliament this morning. Uh, it explodes in the spring, right? We have a very slow, cold uh, and rainy uh, spring in Belgium lately. But yet, uh, within a few days, you come from uh, trees without one leaf on them to every bush and every uh, tree being full of these uh, uh, leaves. And so for me, that evokes a good news, which is nature will take care of itself. Yeah? So this discussion, it's, it's about us. And that is, if we don't transform the way we behave with the rest of nature, well, then nature is going to take care of us. Yeah? We'll be on our exit. And sadly, we're currently also destroying most of diversity on a massive, in fact, extinction level scale. But in the end, nature will thrive. Yes? The, the planet was here billions of years before us. It'll still be there uh, long after we're gone. And this brings us to this panel discussion. It's all about us. Us little things who wonder if we can afford, if we have the money, some say if we have the fiscal, the fiscal space to save ourselves from climate chaos. Welcome to the topic of this panel. Um, so I represent my organization, Finance Watch, and, and our 110 members in 20 EU member states. 
my great team. Uh, also, as Manon mentioned, the Fiscal Matters Coalition, of which we are a proud member, which gathers uh, many civil society organizations, European Trade Union Confederation, European Environment Bureau, uh, European Youth Forum, New Economics Foundation, Climate Action Network, Sustainable Finance Lab, and many others. And we emit making this austere, technocratic uh, debate around the fiscal rules and macroeconomic governance more democratic. So we produce a wealth of pedagogical material which aim at bringing you into this discussion. I'll try to give you a, a small flavor with, within a few minutes. Now, the title of this panel is Building Post-Growth Macroeconomic Governance Framework, Aligning Tools, Rules, and Policies with EU Political Goals. I think you're all very courageous to be sitting here uh, with such a title. Now, the first reality check that's been mentioned is that there is no post-growth perspective in the EU. Nowhere. This discussion we're having, it's an exception. It's uh, an exceptional event organized by exceptional people. Um, on the one hand, I understand at the micro level we feel we're making progress, because 10 years ago it would have been possible. At the macro level, and more crucially, in decision-making circles, it is still mostly inexistent. Yeah? Every European policy is about growth. Every argument for or against uh, a policy is about growth. And by the way, the second reality check is that the current headline in Brussels is pull the brakes on environmental regulation because we need to compete with, that is, we need more GDP growth than the US and China. So we have our hands full collectively to shift the narrative, to um, change the political priorities, propose concrete plans, including as part of the upcoming European elections. We have to make the case for a post-growth society. It still needs to be made. For me, the best way uh, to make that case is to look at the evolution of energy consumption over the last 200 years. Well, that chart is probably in your mind. Looks like a half mountain, steep curve going up with a tiny, tiny glitch in 09, that was the financial crisis, 2020, that was COVID, and then up again. The other characteristic of that, that history, of that chart of energy consumption over the last 200 years, is that sources of energy, they pile up. Yeah? They add to each other. They don't replace each other. So um, it was first wood, then second part of the 19th century, beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution, we added coal to wood, then we added oil to coal, we added gas to oil, then a bit of hydropower and nuclear on top, and then there's a very, very thin layer on the, at the very top, which is wind uh, and solar. In other words, and I warn you this is painful to hear, there has never been an uh, energy transition. It doesn't mean it's not possible, but at this stage it's a fantasy. People ask, how long does it take for an energy transition to take place? We don't know, because we've never done it. And that's why we hear scientists tell us we need a rapid degrowth of fossil fuel energy consumption to avoid climate chaos. Yeah? And because at this stage, decoupling between GDP growth and CO2 emission is also a fantasy, this has been documented, that we get the conclusion we need a good chunk of GDP degrowth and quickly. Now, I should immediately add that's in aggregate, meaning that in some countries, most of the global south, also some regions in Europe, we need some sort of growth. Yeah? Human needs have to be met everywhere on the planet and a sufficient level of, of comfort and well-being. And again, this brings us back to the money part, to go from today's orgy of fossil fuel consumption by a tiny elite, destabilizing our climate, destroying biodiversity, to a steady society meeting the needs of all within planetary boundaries, will require massive investments in the short term, including massive transfers of wealth from the riches to the poorest and also from the north uh, to the south. So we need to deeply transform the way we are organized on the planet. And most of these investments are not profitable, so financial markets won't help. They usually don't. Thus, I understand that the title of this plenary is, is a love killer, but guess what? If we don't ensure that massive public investments uh, are not only allowed, but encouraged to take place and quickly, then all of the rest, what we really care about, which is fighting against climate change, building health, equality, resilience, all of that won't be possible. So can we afford 
to save ourselves meet the needs of all human beings? Do we have the money? Of course we do. Money is a social construct. We could do everything without money. We could create all the money we need. As As with all, with all social constructs, there are social consequences, so they need to be managed, but this can be done peacefully and democratically. But for now, the response to this question, can we afford the public investments in the EU, is no, really, we can't, because we won't allow central banks to create the money we need. We won't take the money where it is, accumulate it in a very few hands, and ta -ta, governments are too indebted. Interestingly, we suspended, as was mentioned, we suspended the fiscal rules forcing a limit, you know, those rules forcing a limit on public debt uh, and deficits to fight the pandemic, but we should now go back to them. And that's the discussion going on at this very moment uh, in Brussels. Most agree that the rules need to be reformed before they come back to avoid brutal and irrational austerity, but then many still argue that there's no room for investment, especially if they are not growth enhancing. So, so this is the minimum, the sort of avoid the worst battle, if you like, that we need to fight. It's to allow governments to spend everything they need to build the long-term resilience we need, uh, and in that case, making an exception, a minima, uh, to allow more borrowing from governments. Recent reports by the New Economics Foundation shows that today only four countries in the EU would have the capacity to invest as needed to uh, make a 1.5 trajectory, and only half of EU countries in GDP terms can even afford to spend enough to reach the uh, much less ambitious uh, climate objectives. We also need to get rid of the numerical uh, benchmarks that you hear a lot about, 3%, 60%. They don't make any sense. At, at Finance Watch, we've been looking recently at this. Even financial markets don't really care so much about the, the 60% debt to GDP ratio. You know, hello, Japan, 250. Hello, United States, 180, um, or the 3% three, uh, annual, three annual deficit limit. So, so that's not a good excuse. You know, there, there is room. And then the last thing is the sooner you make the investments, the cheaper. Yeah? So the more we wait to transform the economy, the more climate change will make us pay the price, also literally. Biodiversity loss creates an increase in the frequency and severity of pandemics, and we've seen how much uh, these cost. So I really hope that all of us will... Uh, help us in fighting that battle in the coming months. But for now, and, and to conclude, I'll leave you with this uh, more fundamental uh, question, which is how long will we, and how long will all of you, uh, continue to tolerate that the rules governing our world be dictated by financial markets, the economists who serve them, central bankers, and ministries of finance? It doesn't have to be this way. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Benoit. Your conclusion was, I think, the very perfect because it shows that this is a democratic issue. And that discussion needs to happen here in the European Parliament, obviously, but it needs to get out of the European Parliament. It needs to be a democratic issue because one cannot be governed by fiscal rules that are not you know, commonly agreed upon in a functioning democratic system. Nevertheless, those rules are not super known, probably, but most importantly, are not necessarily approved in a way or another. And this is why we're tenting today that debate. And this makes a bridge to the next intervention, uh, to uh, Philippa Silk uh, Gluckner, who is the director of the think tank uh, Philippa, you will, you will say the name of the uh, think tank way better than me, so I'll let you uh, say the name because my German is, is really not good. Um, Philippa, you're certainly the, the person um, that among all of us here, and she's going to join us online, um, knows the best all of the details about the, the fiscal rules. Um, you've looked very closely at the reform that has been proposed by the European Commission uh, in the last few weeks. And you're going to tell us um, about something that is a bit under the radar, but is highly important and political when looking at the rules in details. Philippa, the floor is yours. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you very much for indulging me online. Um, 
got a fairly technical issue. Um, we need to talk about it because in this case the technical is deeply um, political. I don't know whether you can already see the slide deck. I currently can't see where it's at. Um, you, maybe you can start the slides. Is that so? I can't see them anywhere. Ah, perfect. Great. Um, so let me start with a very brief introduction to, to the proposal for the reform of the European um, fiscal rules. Um, and we won't have time to go into all the detail um, because 10 minutes is quite a short time to talk about such a big topic. But just briefly, so what do the fiscal rules now aim at or, or target? Basically, it's now all about the debt-to-GDP ratio. Debt-to-GDP ratio, uh, Benoit already said it, of 60% doesn't make any sense. I would argue generally debt-to-GDP ratios don't make much sense. Uh, we're talking about beyond growth today. Um, this is a ratio that fundamentally pegs our whole fiscal policy to, to growth in a fairly senseless way. But this is now becoming the only goal, and that, that was actually a bit different in the past, is that... Um, we need to have declining debt-to-GDP ratios going to 60%. So this is the North Star for everything. It doesn't have very much to do with a sustainable um, carbon-neutral world. Then, and this is now, I'm coming to, to the slide I'm currently showing you, um, the, the tool they're using to get to this and to then define what governments need to do is a debt sustainability analysis. So the European Commission is, wants to do a calculation, basically a projection to see where, how debt stocks develop uh, under certain um, assumptions. And from that, calculate backwards to determine for, for four years an expenditure path for um, governments. So based on this technical calculation, they're going to tell sovereign parliaments um, for the next four years what their budget limit is going to be. And what I'm showing you here is the time span we're talking about for making these projections based on which we fix the expenditure paths. So if um, we don't have any, governments don't propose any reforms, basically the time frame becomes a bit shorter, um, but we're still talking about um, trying to project what's happening in the world, trying to project debt stocks um, five years in the future up to 15 years in the future. If they do reforms, we try to project even further out and we're trying to project into 17 years into the future. We're trying to uh, project debt stocks. If you think about 70s, 17 years into the future, that gets us to 2040. By 2040, we will have to have managed a big chunk of the transition. So while on the climate side, we're entering a time where we say we really can't predict anything. It's going to be, you know, one of the times of the most like rapid changes in society and the economy we've ever seen. On the economic side, we are saying we can project everything 17 years into the future and make policy today based on that. Um, so I think there is quite a bit of schizophrenia. Next slide, please. Now I do actually want to show you, and, and I hope this doesn't scare you, what the debt sustainability analysis um, that the EU Commission wants to do, what that looks like, um, and you know, basically every fiscal policy is going to be based on this kind of calculation. Um, I'm showing you the example for, um, for the Netherlands, um, could, could be any country, um, just to give you an idea. Basically it's an Excel calculation. And you see the bottom line, um, this is at the top, it's the debt to GDP ratio. This is the only thing that matters. This is what we're trying to project here. We don't care about anything else. And we do this based on assumptions about um, the primary balance, so how much the government is, um, is, is spending more than it, uh, than it makes, excluding financing costs. So basically the part of the budget that's under the control of the government. Then assumptions about interest rates. This is already an interesting one because interest rates are not coming from heaven, right? They're set by the European Central Bank. So making assumptions about something and saying, you know, that's exogenous, that's fixed, 
but it's actually said by by um, by the European Central Bank might be a little bit incoherent. And then thirdly, assumptions about growth. Um, and one of the key problems, and this is actually where I had to <laughs> think quite hard in like the previous contributions, is that the assumptions about growth normally entail very, very low growth. And now one could say, oh, from a post-growth perspective, that's great. And actually, that's not great at all. Because the less growth we have in here in the projections, the less space we get fiscally, um, because everything targets uh, the debt to GDP ratio. It basically means no investment for climate. But the important thing about the calculation here is we can't really project any of the indicators they're showing here. Um, it's all about politics. Who knows what growth is going to look like in 17, 17 years into the future? Who knows what interest rates are going to look like? And yeah, we can influence them as society. But still, we're taking these technical calculations and we say, well, this is what we're going to base our fiscal policy um, uh, on, and we're going to tell national parliaments what to do. The one thing you haven't seen in here is any kind of climate constraint or anything related to actually greening the economy. This is just not part of the fiscal rule framework. Next slide, please. I've already hinged at the uncertainty that we're faced with. Um, I want to make this a bit more clearer how, how big the uncertainty is. What I'm showing you here is the debt sustainability analysis for Italy. In the past, we've never done them 17 years out into the future. We've done them for five years. Um, and I'm showing the, you the most up-to-date one for Italy. What we do is, or what they do is they project probabilities. Um, so with what certainty they can say within what range um, debt to GDP will lie. And you see the, the fan kind of going up. Um, now, I've tried to just extend that for 17 years into the future and show, show you with how much certainty we can say anything. Um, and so basically, you know, you, you see the boundaries of the fan and the answer is we can't say anything about 17 years into the future. And this is not even considering, um, you know, the massive changes we should be having in the economy if we really undergo a rapid transformation. So we're pinning all our fiscal policy to something we don't really know anything about that is very political and that doesn't include anything related to climate or sustainability. Next slide, please. So beyond the problem with the technical tool um, and debt to GDP being fairly self-centered and, and not really linking to any broader societal goal, there's actually straightforward incompatibility of goals. So what I'm showing you here on the left, and I hope um, the chart is big enough that you can see it, is projections of the debt to GDP ratio for Europe. Um, and the dashed line is where the projection starts, and the bottom line is if we don't have any incremental expenditure for uh, climate and for defense spending. So this is just basically business as usual, but um, we have increasing financing costs because interest rates have gone up and increasing costs of aging because we're an aging society. So even if we don't spend any more money on climate and defense, um, we will have um, increasing debt to GDP ratios. Now the top line is if we do spend 1% of GDP on climate um, and we try and reach the 2% the uh, NATO goal for, for defence, which everybody wants to reach. So if we're trying to make the climate goals, I don't think spending 1% of GDP is, is uh, overly generous. <laughs> we're not going to have falling debt to GDP stocks. Never, ever. It's not going to work. And then everybody talks about prioritising funds. But seriously, tell me what to prioritise. Um, if we want to have a transformation, we need to look after people. So, you know, in doubt, have slightly higher social expenditures. We need people working in administrations to make the transformation happen. So we need to spend money on, on personnel and we need big investments. So the current goal of falling debt to GDP stocks is fundamentally incompatible with the transition. Next slide, please.
Please go to the next slide. All right, let me just conclude. I'm not sure the slide is showing, at least I can't see it. Um, just to conclude, what I want you to take away from this, because we need to speak in concrete terms, this reform of the fiscal rules is, is now happening. What do I suggest we should do? What should we call for? First of all, these debt sustainability analysis should be public. I think that's very important because they are political. Every line in that debt sustainability um, analysis um, has a... Um, you're now showing the wrong slide. It would be the next one that would be helpful. Um, every line in that debt sustainability, yes, great, is is a political one. So we need to debate them out in public if we make our fiscal policy dependent on them. So debt sustainability analysis need to be fully public, all the calculations. Secondly, if we base our fiscal policy on calculations on the economy, on GDP, we need to somehow add an emission constraint somewhere. We're just pretending that we're projecting the past forward, you know, GDP growth, everything like business as usual. And that's just completely not the case. We have a massive additional constraint in the economy right now, and it's not reflected, so we should add an emission target constraint in there. Then we should not introduce an obligation to reduce the debt to GDP quota. If we do that um, and we make it fixed, I mean, there's absolutely no way that we will have the, space, the fiscal space to do investments for, for the transition. And then finally, I think we really need to start urgently to move away from debt to GDP. We won't be able to fully replace this indicator right now. I mean, you see it's the, the one big anchor for fiscal policy, but I think we should start to think about alternative indicators. And one for me could be tracking green fiscal sustainability, as in looking at the ratio between debt and then the asset stock of the economy, which is already ready for a net zero world. So what do I mean by this? Basically counting you know, all the industry, counting the, the infrastructure that is already um, net zero compatible, that works without creating any CO2 emissions. And if you take the ratio between debt and that, you will have a completely different focus from, from what we have right now, and you will actually start to embed our, our climate goals um, into your fiscal policy. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh Philippa, now that we've, we've been really diving into the technical details of the fiscal rules, which I think was really important to understand what we were talking about and, uh, and, and the direction that the reform is taking, we're going to move back to Joseph. Hopefully, uh, he is back online um, to sort of uh, de-zoom again. Uh, Joseph, if, if, if you can resume where you, you, where you were, but for about five minutes to make sure we can have enough time uh, then to, to move on the conversation. Hopefully this is going to work this time, Joseph. Thanks again for joining us. Okay, you. thank you. Hopefully it will work. Uh, I was talking to myself evidently for uh, a large part of my talk. Uh, there were seven points I wanted to make, and they relate both to the governance of monetary as well as fiscal policy. Uh, would I? Uh, the first point was that today's inflation uh, is mainly supply side dr driven. Uh, it was a result of. Uh, the pandemic and the supply side interruptions, uh, the demand shifts associated uh, with the pandemic, uh, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, it was exacerbated by the flawed uh, uh, policies related to the pricing of electricity in Europe. Uh, the minister correctly emphasized uh, that there were alternatives. Uh, the model used in Iberian uh, was an example. There was no need to increase electricity prices to the extent that they did. Uh, it was a result of a neoliberal regulatory framework uh, that should not have been implemented uh, given the wartime nature of what was going on, and it caused uh, enormous uh, unnecessary suffering within Europe. The implication, and this is the second point, that it is a supply side interruption, not the normal 
excess demand and interruption is that raising interest rates in the way the ECB and the Fed have recently done may actually be counterproductive. It will impede the green tracks, uh, 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 it will impede uh, making the investments that are both needed to alleviate the supply side interruptions and to make the green transition. Um, it will necessarily contribute to unemployment and inequality. Uh, the third point focuses on uh, fiscal policy uh, and has already been emphasized by every speaker. It, is, will be, it, it will be necessary to give more flexibility to f fiscal policy to enable the large public investments that will be required. Uh, if we are going to make a successful green transition. Uh, at a minimum, uh, we will have to replace the current structures with a green golden rule. The nature of the green transition is that it will require upfront investments. Uh, the uh, maintenance of, for instance, uh, uh, electric vehicles is much lower. Uh, they last longer. It's actually uh, better uh, for uh, the economy in a uh, fundamentally a fundamental sense, but it requires upfront investments to make that transition. And uh, some of those investments will have to be in the public sector. Uh, it was always wrong, I thought, to focus on uh, one side of the balance sheet, the debt, without looking at the other side the assets. But that becomes particularly important uh, in the current context. Uh, so uh, the, uh, 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 the, the kind of minimal changes in uh, the fiscal governance rules in Europe will be insufficient uh, to uh, deal with uh, the green transition. The fourth point is that uh, this increased investment, public investment will require using uh, tax, increasing taxes. Um, there are a whole array of taxes that Europe uh, can and should uh, impose. Uh, uh, it, there should be a, a, a European-wide uh, uh, profits taxes on multinationals, a wealth tax, a financial transaction tax, but particularly in the context of the current uh, uh, situation where a number of firms have made uh, enormous profits, there should be a windfall profits tax, and that windfall profits tax needs to be larger, more substantial than uh, the a measly corporate uh, windfall profits tax that Europe has levied. Uh, the sixth point uh, is that one can use tax policy to actually change the structure of uh, uh, the European economy to help the economy move towards uh, a green economy. And here I'm thinking particularly of uh, the imposition of carbon taxes. The price of carbon, if we want to think of it that way, needs to be somewhere in the order of magnitude of $150 a ton, maybe 200 But the current level of uh, prices associated with the cap-and-trade system is simply insufficient. Uh, the imposition of a European-wide carbon tax would both incentivize the private sector to make more investment, making the economy more robust, but would also provide revenues which would help finance the green transition. And the final point that I wanted to make is that the green transition is a, the uh, 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 reducing uh, carbon emissions is a global issue. Climate change is a global issue. The advanced countries have made, provided insufficient help to those in the developing countries and emerging markets. And uh, as one thinks about the fiscal framework 
of Europe. One has to include in that fiscal framework uh, substantial assistance to developing countries and emerging markets. Even if Europe gets to net neutrality by 2050 or even before that, the planet will not be saved unless the emerging markets and developing countries also limit their emissions. And given their low standards of living, uh, uh, it will be difficult to get them on board unless substantial help is provided. So this is a short summary of what I talked about before, before I lost my connection. I hope this gives you a feeling for the, the important changes that need to meet, be made in the uh, macroeconomic governance of Europe that will facilitate Europe going beyond uh, growth um, and uh, making uh, uh, an economic agenda that promotes well-being not only within Europe, but for the planet as a whole. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Joseph. Um, clearly, the, the summary was, was great enough, and thanks again for, for being with us today. Um, and I think, in a way, you outlined the sort of contradiction in the Commission's proposal between uh, the date's uh, sustainability on one hand and environmental sustainability on the other hand. And those are the two pillars on which the Commission proposes its reform uh, of uh, the macroeconomic uh, framework. And this is exactly what Louison is going to uh, focus uh, uh, on. Louison Ken Fouro is an um, assistant professor at uh, the Roskilde University in Denmark and member of the International Society for Ecological Economics. Um, I do hope, by the way, that you're going to be uh, super supportive of Louison because he almost lost his voice, uh, but we'll still uh, make it today. So thanks again, uh, Louison, for, for being with us today. And I think it will be important to, to, to sort of de-zoom on the economic uh, governance uh, and uh, to see how we solve that contradiction that I was highlighting. Louison, the floor is yours. Hi everyone. Yeah, as you can hear, my voice sounds is a bit as sane as growth at the moment. Let's hope it lasts for the session. So I would like to thank very much the organizer for this uh, plenary and for this uh, amazing conference. Some uh, already say that it's the Woodstock of post-growth. I think that's pretty accurate. <laughs> May, maybe that's also why I don't really have a voice anymore. Um, so this session is entitled Building Post-Growth Macroeconomic Governance Framework, Aligning Tools, Rules and Policies with EU Political Goals. And you know what? I'm really wondering if that's not the EU technocratic way to say, all right, guys, let's all have a big party together that may well end up in the joyful termination of capitalism. And, I mean, what a wild session title, right? Like, uh, post-growth macroeconomic governance framework. Ooh, it's really exciting. So, uh, let's see if it is not rather uh, the EU's political goals that we should align with post-growth. But, in any case, uh, to build, we need to understand where we start from. So, in this short talk, I would like to take a macroeconomic and political economy perspective to highlight a few contradictions emerging within growth regimes and to mention some possible post-growth policy uh, principles to remedy them. So before I go any further, let me define a few concepts. In a nutshell, growth regime refers to a dynamic compatibility between an organization of production, for instance, Fordism, Taylorism, Toyotism, a distribution of income, for instance, between wages and profits, and a composition of demand, so all the goods and services that we consumed. And each growth regime is a specific kind of capitalism. And currently, at least in high-income countries, we live in a type of capitalism that is based on a financialized and globalized growth regime. And such a growth regime generates rising inequalities, financial instability, and considerably aggravates the ecological crisis. In return, in return, it is increasingly difficult 
to synchronize production and consumption at the global scale and to ensure the stability of the global growth regime. So of course, of course capitalism can certainly be uh, much improved. It should be and it should be urgently. And some aspects of the European Green Deal will indeed improve European capitalism and that's a good thing. However, however, it remains highly unsure whether any kind of capitalism, meaning any growth regime, would do, even an inclusive, green, sustainable, net zero, nature positive, choose your favorite bullshit keywords growth regime. <laughs> Indeed, whatever specific institutional settings are, capitalism remains, uh, remains a system based on social relations of production that are inherently exploitative, competitive, and conflictual. And as such, it contains the roots of its own unsustainability, even if strongly regulated, and even if substantially improved. And this is where post-growth kicks in. So what is post-growth? It refers to a society that is emancipated from the need to grow its economy to ensure political stability, social cohesion, and individual and collective well-being. And therefore, post-growth really refers to the destination. And in that sense, it is different from degrowth, which rather refers to the transition. But let's go back to uh, growth regimes for a bit. So the historical context creates and exacerbates contradiction within key areas of regulation that are supposed to stabilize growth regime and capitalism. And these are also areas of intervention for a post-growth agenda. So I will not be exhaustive here, but I will mention a few contradictions concerning the monetary regime, the state, labor markets, and labor capital relations. The monetary regime refers to the set of rules governing the monetary system, in particular monetary policy, and we can see at the moment two prominent contradictions emerging, an internal one and an external one. The internal contradiction is between the so-called green turn in central banking and central bank practices to tackle inflation. The lack of flexibility in instruments and mandates results on a completely made-up conflict of objective when, for instance, central banks rise interest rates to tackle inflation, which goes directly against fostering the low-carbon transition. The external contradiction lies between monetary policy and environmental policy. The use of blunt monetary policy instruments such as undifferentiated target interest rates contradicts environmental objectives such as decarbonization through investment in renewables or, most importantly, through investment in massive economies of energy. And despite the measures that have been announced by the European Central Bank to green its operation, for instance, adapting its collateral eligibility framework, which is most welcome, it is highly unsure whether such contradiction can be solved without deeper change in the mandate, objective, and governance of the ECB. And this leads to emerging contradiction, contradiction within the state. The welfare state is, or could be, a very powerful vector of emancipation and of social ecological transformation. However, in capitalism, a key function of the welfare state is to redistribute income not so much for emancipation, but so most of the population accesses mass consumption. And this is needed to ensure the synchronization with mass production and is thus an essential component of the stability of growth regimes. And this creates a contradiction between the capitalist welfare state and the environmental state, which refers to the set of laws, rules, and public administration managing environmental issues. The environmental state imposes, or should impose, rising constraints on production and consumption that contradicts the logic of mass production and mass consumption enabled by the welfare state. And this is why we must integrate and transform the environmental and the welfare states into a social ecological state. And of course, we should also include the central bank into the mix because it is part of the extended state. However, it is unsure whether this is possible within current EU fiscal rules and competition regulations. Another key aspect that is, of course, underlying here is the organization of work in our societies and income distributions between social classes. We can mention two contradictions regarding labor markets and labor capital relations. First, 
shifting to a sustainable production and consumption processes will entail cutting down on some production and consumption while growing others up to a certain point. And it will also entail to produce better to satisfy needs, which is not necessarily financially profitable or profitable enough by current standards. However, however, the volume of work is very much linked to growth and jobs depend on profitability. Moreover, work remains the main vector of social integration and of individual achievement. Therefore, in our current economy, the determination of the volume of work and of the allocation of jobs and the social role of work contradict the satisfaction of social and environmental needs. Second, lower productivity gains due to thermodynamics limiting our ability to increase efficiency exacerbate income distribution conflict between wages and profits and therefore increase the already high social conflictuality of our societies. And this contradiction cannot be solved within current labor policies aiming at lengthening working time, extending working age and constantly putting downward pressure on so-called labor costs, forgetting that labor costs are also the income of workers. And moreover, deregulated capital flows are also a major obstacle to solve these contradictions. So what to do about that within the time that I have left? Well, let's mention a couple of principles amongst many, many others. So first, we must collectively decide what is green and what is not. Currently, green is a very wishy-washy notion that is at best decided upon through opaque, technocratic and inconsistent taxonomies. So we need democratic processes informed by science to decide what kind of production and consumption are useful, sustainable and needed and to what extent they are. In short, we need democracy. <laughs> Thanks, because I really needed to drink. So, uh, <laughs> first, um, so in short, we need democracy in production and consumption. And this includes, of course, monetary and financial institutions. Second, the rules governing fiscal policy, such as the Stability and Growth Pact, um, must be completely reformed. I mean, just the name, right? Stability and Growth Pact. So the focus of these rules on public debt and growth is meaningless and detrimental, as uh, Philippa explained. And indeed, indeed, I mean, even in a growth perspective, these fiscal rules have prevented socio-economic and productive convergence within the European Union, which remains a highly polarized economic region. And this is a structural weakness lying at the heart of the uh, European construction. And such polarization... <clears throat> Such polarization throws people of Europe against each other and deprives governments from southern and eastern European countries of resources to under undertake social ecological transformation. But beyond technicalities, the issue with these rules are fundamentally the underlying philosophy, ideology and project of society that fails to deliver on social and environmental grounds. And such project of society lags behind the conversation of the world and in particular it lags behind the aspiration of younger generation. So this is not to say that no harmonizing fiscal policies in an economic and monetary union should be in place. However, such rules should be democratically deliberated upon by European citizens. They should be based upon social and environmental criteria instead of growth and public debt. They should foster socio-economic and productive convergence through moving European economies towards more energy and material sobriety and simplicity. And they should be flexible through regular adjustments and counter-cyclicality. So as you can see, and I will conclude, these principles are neither utopian nor technically hard to implement. Some of them are largely feasible within capitalism and they would improve it substantially precisely because they would tame down its core logic. However, they do require a strong political willingness and a renewed project of society. And of course, of course, some people will, say, will always argue that the slightest attempt at reform is unrealistic. We know this rhetoric, right? So let alone post-growth or post-capitalist uh, reforms, right? Uh, but let's never be shy, really let's never be shy to question who gets to decide what is realistic and what is not on behalf of what view of the world and on, what in on behalf of what interests. <laughs>
And, and let's never be shy to contest so-called realism, for we should always remember that we, collectively as societies, have the realism we give to ourselves. And this is, I guess, why we are all here in this conference. So now let's do it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Rizzo. It was worth losing your voice uh, here in the post gross Woodstock. Um, Philip might be happy that we've renamed our joint conference as the, as the Woodstock post gross I wish we will we'll come back in a te 10 years time and we will date that moment from, from when the whole, no, not only narrative, but practice will have changed in the European Union. The next years will tell us whether we were true or not. I'll move on to the questions on Slido. Um, we still have Philippa and Joseph online, so hopefully we can have the questions showing up. Can we? Otherwise, I'm going to take the yes. Okay, the first question. Uh, this is very democratic, by the way. This is the question that's been rated the most. I wish the European Union would be always so democratic, but that's another question. Um, so the central bank responsible for all our currencies are not preparing for any post-growth scenarios. How can we get them on board? You've talked a little bit on this, Luis, or maybe you can quickly develop. Uh, we'll take another 10 minutes, and, uh, so hopefully we can get through a few questions so you can answer that one. Yes, yeah, so I'll try to be quick. Thank you very much for the question. It's a key question. So there are a number of things that can be done, even, for instance, changing anything else at the moment, just changing the composition of uh, the committees and boards of the central bank, which is, for instance, representative of the workers, of uh, environmental NGOs, of so civil society, would already shape differently the rationality with which central bank interpret the information that they receive from the payment system uh, that they are in charge of. So that already would already make a big difference. And of course, the next step is uh, to reform their governance, to change their mandate, to, including to include other objectives, not to be shy to say that the central bank is not the right institution to take care of inflation because in Inflation is primarily not a monetary phenomenon, okay, uh, and therefore should focus on other objectives such as uh, uh, post post future. Thanks very much, Louise. When talking about uh, democracy, that's part of the things that need to be reformed because we, as member of the European Parliament, we have no power over the policies of the European Central Bank, and we're the only place in the world where there's no debate, public debate, and uh, where the, the central bank that is not accountable to, uh, to people that are elected. So the second question I fear is for me. Um, do you think uh, fear of losing hard um, one social rights and benefits in a growing economy prevents the left from advocating from degrowth, for degrowth. Uh, it will be quite easy uh, question to answer on my side. I can only speak on, on, on my behalf and, and behalf of the left group. I think not only we should not be afraid of calling for degrowth, but we should not be afraid of checking the very roots and basis on which the European Union has been grounded, especially growth of fossil fuels um, and everything that has been grown over the last few years and it's definitely not the direction that should be taken. And yes, we can develop a different economy and I hope that these three days conferences have proved it. And I do hope that the next time I'm going to talk about degrowth in this parliament, you guys might not be sitting at our seats, but maybe on top, but I hope that this time it will have more echo after that conference. So that was a rather easy one to answer. Um, for Joseph, the next one, how can growth be disconnected from environmental resource consumption, given that any activity requires energy consumption from the environment? It's not an easy one, but I can give on to yeah. you. Well, the question is, what are the level of emissions per GDP or per unit of growth? And if we change the structure of consumption, and if we have innovation that requires uh, less and less uh, energy, uh, and we rely more and more on renewable energy, 
we can break the current re link between uh, emissions and uh, consumption, uh, emissions and output. Uh, there is no inherent relationship uh, between the two. Uh, we have enough instruments to break that link. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so the next question, <laughs> I, like, I like them because they're all very political and I guess I'm not gonna ask you that question. Will any party running in the 2024 European Parliament election, so next year, advocate in its program to change DG growth for DG well-being? The easy answer is yes, I said it at the beginning, and I do hope that my left group is not going to be the only one, and I look at my friends in the green groups, uh, which for sure are going to support this as well. And hopefully that side of the parliament is going to be bigger than the far right that doesn't care about well-being. The next one, what can we do to ensure economies talking about beyond growth, except that this must also mean beyond capitalism, given the capitalist growth imperative. I guess I could ask the question to any of you. Do you want to first jump in, Benoit? I can give a, a quick try, but it's been very documented that, that growth has been discussed is strictly correlated to the, the beginning of the use of fossil fuels, right? And certainly industrial capitalism. So um, t today one doesn't go uh, without the other. So I'm afraid that indeed if we need to take that GDP growth uh, massively down, it will require a, a, a different set of rules. And, and to the previous question about uh, alternative indicators, I think everything is in the alternative, right? If, if you replace uh, GDP growth as a key indicator with others, that's okay. If you just add them on top, it doesn't work. And, and I'm afraid, you know, there's that confusion about beyond growth, which really you, you can feel from some EU officials who came here the last two days, where they, they'll be like, yes, beyond growth. So we, we keep growth, the, the full of it, as a key priority, and then we add to it, you know, yeah. sustainable indicators, well-being indicators. And so it made me think about something like you have a program to end alcoholism, right? You call it beyond alcoholism, and someone would tell you, oh, yes, yes, so, so of course we keep alcoholism, we keep drinking as much, uh, but then on top of it, we'll add a bit of meditation, yoga, and, and vitamin intakes. Um, so can we say that the European Commission can we say, Benoit, that the European Commission is drunk of growth? Yeah. If, it was, if it was just the Commission. So we need to stop the madness, right? We, um, you need to stop the madness and, and you know, sh shut the tap. So, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. Thanks very much, Benoit. Um, maybe the next, the next one to you, Philippa. Um, deficit and debt are macroeconomic tools that stimulate growth. How can a degrowth agenda be compatible with higher deficits and more debt? It's not an easy one, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> well, I first had to figure out the speak button, which is about um, as hard. Um, well, what, what do higher deficits and, and debt mean and why are they a problem? Um, I think I would go back to Benoit's um, statement, you know, money is a social construct and government debt is actually fairly close to money. I think it's much, much closer to money than private debt because governments, you know, when they have a sovereign currency, and this is where it gets a bit difficult in Europe, um, can always uh, service their own debt, so it's not like a private obligation. So I would actually be a lot, lot less worried about um, debt in general. Um, it becomes very complicated when you try to think through why it's a problem. Um, in Europe, we have mainly created a problem for ourselves um, by deciding that governments shouldn't really have sovereign debt, that you know they should be able to go something like bankrupt, um, that we can judge their debt to be unsustainable and then the European Central Bank can't buy it anymore. So I think the, the question is much more complicated, um, not even just linked to growth or degrowth, is, is you know, why is government debt and when is it a problem? What does debt sustainability even mean? Um, it's, it's a question you could debate for hours. So I wouldn't think that growth or no growth is the key problem. Thanks very much, uh, Philippa, and I don't want to keep you all 
too long uh, for uh, the coffee break. So um, I know it's frustrating, but I, I'll have to end it there. We are going to hang out around, so feel free to, to come to us to ask us questions. I just wanted to, in conclusion, first to thank our panelists uh, for being with us our remotely. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks, Philippa. Uh, thanks, Louison. Thanks, Benoit. Uh, thanks again to all of the teams that have been organizing it. And I have to say that sitting here and looking at all of you, seeing how young uh, the attendance he uh, here is, how radical the way, and I can see it in your reaction, I think this would have never been possible a couple of years ago. And I do hope that in a couple of years' time, actually people like you would have taken over the power to make sure that the European Commission and all of those that are drunk by gross, actually we've healed them. Thanks very much.